Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we start on the exciting journey into volume two of Great Expectations, looking at chapters 20 to 23. As always, it's really important you've read these chapters before watching the rest of this video. So if you haven't, please pause, go away and read them and come back when you're ready. I'm going to start off by reading a summary of those chapters, just so we're really clear on the main plot events that have happened. So in chapter 20, Pip arrives in London for the first time and goes to Jagger's office, which is close to both Smithfield Meat Market and Newgate Prison, two really important locations. While he waits for Jaggers, he is given a tour of the prison and sees just how powerful and influential Jaggers is. Pip is given money and told where to stay at Barnard's Inn with a man called Herb Pocket. In chapter 21, Pip is taken to Barnard's Inn by Wemmick, who is Jaggers' clerk, who seems very unfriendly and wooden. The buildings in Barnard's Inn are dilapidated and falling apart. Here where Pip meets Herbert Pocket, who turns out to be the pale young gentleman who challenged him to a fight in Miss Habersham's yard. The two of them are very quickly the best of friends. In chapter 22, Herbert is obviously very poor, but Pip sees straight away that he is a gentleman, and we start understanding the theme here of the difference between gentlemen and gentlemen, the difference between being a gentleman having money and being a gentleman because of your behaviour and your in a very tactful way, Herbert begins to improve Pip's table manners. He also decides to call him Handel. Over the meal, he tells Pip the story of Miss Havisham, and how as a rich young woman in line to inherit the family business and property, she was proposed to by a man called Compison. It turned out, however, that he had no intention of marrying her, and had plotted with her half-brother to take her money and leave her waiting for him on her wedding day. Since then, she's not been out of the house and has remained in her wedding dress. Herbert's father, Matthew, who was the only one to warn her against her fiancé, was dismissed by her and has not been back since. Estella remains a bit of a mystery. Herbert only knows that she's been brought up by Miss Havisham, and Miss Havisham wants Estella to be her revenge on all men. In chapter 23, a visit to Herbert's family is very confusing and it's a very disordered place. Herbert's mother thinks that she's been denied her rightful situation in life and leaves the running of the house to the servants. Pip meets two young men who will be who will be educated with him, Drummond and Startop. So that's where we're going to stop at the end of chapter 23. So the four areas that we're really going to uh, explore are these. In chapter 20, we're going to have a look at Pip's first impressions of London and Dickens's description of those settings. In chapter 21, we're going to have a look at Pip's arrival at Barnard's Inn and his disappointment, how his expectations differed from the reality. We're also going to have a look at the return of the pale young gentleman who is Herbert Pocket. In chapter 22, we're going to look at the aspect of guest narration, which is something we saw in The Great Gatsby as well, when Jordan Baker and Gatsby himself narrate elements of the story. Herbert is going to narrate the story of Miss Havisham, which Pip could not possibly have known. And finally, we're going to take a brief look at the comic interlude of the Pocket household. So the first section we're going to have a look at is chapter 20 and Pip's first impressions of London. We're going to read uh, two or three extracts and have a look at a little bit of context to do with Dickens' his own personal opinions. Um, and we're going to explore um, these new settings for Pip and what it, what it means for him. So we're going to begin um, in chapter 20 on on uh, the description of Jagger's office and the motif of death and masks. So let's have a look at that first extract together. And we're going to be focusing on a couple of themes through the crime and the Gothic. Listen to this. Mr. Jagger's room was lighted by a skylight only and was a most dismal place. The skylight eccentrically pitched like a broken head, and the distorted adjoining houses looking as if they had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it. There were not so many papers about as I should have expected to see, and there were some odd objects about that should not have expected to see, such as an old rusty pistol, a sword in a scabbard, several strange-looking boxes and packages, and two dreadful casts on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. 
Mr Jagger's own high-backed chair was of deadly black horsehair with rows of brass nails round it, like a coffin, and I fancied I could see how he leaned back in it and bit his forefinger at his clients. The room was but small, and the clients seemed to have had a habit of backing up against the wall, the wall especially opposite to Mr Jaggers's chair being greasy with shoulders. I recalled too that the one-eyed gentleman had shuffled forth against the wall when I was the innocent cause of his being turned out. So let's have a look at a couple of elements of what's going on here. First of all, um, we're getting our impression of Jaggers before we've actually met him fully for the first time. We've had a couple of glimpses of him until now in the novel. Um, we've got elements of the uncanny here. Um, we've got these two casts of, of dead men on his shelf, so sort of... Uh, almost like a papier-mâché moulding of, of, their, of their death masks that Jaggers has got displayed almost as like prizes on his mantelpiece. And that's a very sort of gothic element that links to the uncanny, this idea of things which appear human and familiar, but are actually distinctly unfamiliar and, and unhuman and, and unsettling and disturbing because these faces are swollen and twitchy. They're not quite as they should be. We've also got the link to the coffin with the deadly black horsehair and the rows of brass nails, reminding us that this element of death is, is surrounding Jaggers and his character. We've also got this idea of being looked at and being watched and judged, as Pip thinks about the um, skylight at the top of this paragraph, which is pitched like a broken head, as so though it was um, peeping down at me through through the window. So we've got the personification of inanimate objects as though they're watching Pip. Um, and we've also got this element of grease on the walls. Jaggers is so intimidating and so scary that people who come into his office are, are backing up against the wall in fear and the grease from their shoulders is smeared over the wall. And this links to this element of dirt that can't be sort of washed off and, and can't be got rid of. Um, you might think about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth with her bloody hand and she can't get the spot of blood off her hands, uh, symbolising her guilt. We have the dirt that sticks to and around Pip the whole way through this book, symbolising his guilt. And we'll see more of that when we get to Smithfield Market. So let's have a look at his first arrival at Smithfield Market. And we're going to see how Pip's first expectations of London all associate with crime, butchery and punishment. When I told the clerk that I would take a turn in the air while I waited, he advised me to go round the corner and I should come into Smithfield. So I came into Smithfield, and the shameful place, being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam, seemed to stick to me. So I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building, which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. So this is a wonderful little um, paragraph of, sort of six lines or so. And we see that continuation of dirt and crime that is sticking to Pip. His expectations have been disappointed. He's, he's misread what London would be like. The streets aren't paved with gold, as he had imagined. And, and look at some of the language techniques here. Remember, Dickens is a, is a big uh, user of lists. Look at the filth and fat and blood and foam. You've got those plosive F sounds, filth, fat and foam. You've got the plosive D and T at the end of those words, and you've got the polysyndetic listing building up this vision for us as readers as we can almost smell and, and taste this setting. Everything is a smear. It's not neatly placed. It's, it's sort of smeared around him and seems to stick to him. And as he tries to escape it, all he can run into is the great black dome of St. Paul's. And, and notice that the dome is black here. Um, there's two connotations. We've got the physical blackness of it because it's so dirty and smeared with pollution from the city. But we've also got the figurative meaning of it being black and Dickens's views to do with religion being corrupt and, and morally hollow and, 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 and essentially evil rather than good. Notice how the dome is bulging at Pip 
which reminds us of those gates and dikes and banks in chapter three that seemed to run at him as he was taking the food to the convict. So once again, like the window in Jagger's office, Pip feels as though things are bulging towards him and looking at him and he feels oppressed and watched and judged. And the final thing we can look at in um, this chapter is this idea of crime and punishment. Like we're going to think about Dickens and his views on capital punishment. But Newgate Prison is mentioned here as well. And this links back to the gibbet um, on the marshes used for, for hanging pirates and his vision of Miss Havisham hanging from a beam. So again, death is never far away from Pip. Let's have a look at this little section. While I looked about me here, an exceedingly dirty and partially drunk Minister of Justice asked me if I would like to step in and hear a trial or so, informing me that he could give me a front place for half a crown, whence I should command a full view of the Lord Chief Justice in his wig and robes, mentioning that awful personage like waxwork, and presently offering him at the reduced price of eighteen pence. As I declined the proposal on the plea of an appointment, he was so good as to take me into a yard and show me where the gallows was kept, and also where people were publicly whipped, and then he showed me the debtor's door, out of which the culprits came to be hanged, heightening the interest of that dreadful portal by giving me to understand that four of them would come out at that door the day after tomorrow at eight in the morning to be killed in a row. This was horrible and gave me a sickening idea of London. So once again, Pip's expectations aren't meeting up with is what he what he hoped for. Um, and this description of, of Newgate Prison is and the gallows is linking to the punishment that we see in the marshes of the gibbet and Miss Havisham supposedly hanging from a beam in a vision that Pip had there when he was there in part one. Um, but once again, death, crime and punishment are following Pip the whole way through the novel. He can't escape them. And Dickens, remember, um, one of the five types of novel popular in this era was the sort of social justice, so moral purpose novel. And Dickens had his own moral views on public executions. And, and I'm going to direct you to a piece of reading now. So Dickens wrote in the newspaper, um, on his views on public executions. And I've attached to the email um, that I've just sent you um, the, the full article that he wrote, so you can take time to read the, the whole thing. Um, he was very much against public executions. He saw them as um, barbaric, uncivilized, cruel. Um, and it's this particular part here that I want you to have a look at, that um, he was hoping the government might be in Juice to give the support to a measure making the infliction of capital punishment a private solemnity within the prison walls. So he's not necessarily against capital punishment um, per se, but about the public nature of it. The fact that people would come from villages and towns and cities all around to come and watch this spectacle. And it was horrifying. And, and Pip is horrified by this as well. So through his writing, Dickens is getting his social purpose across to readers as well. He wants them to be shocked and appalled, just as he was. So in the second section, then we're going to have a look at chapter 21. Uh, we're going to have a look at the arrival at Barnard's Inn, the disappointment that Pitt feels and the way that uh, the poem gentleman returns. So firstly, let's have a look at this introduction to the character of Wemmick. A really great description from Dickens, a very uh, typical piece of Dickens description. I found him to be a dry man, rather short in stature, with a square wooden face, whose expression seemed to have been imperfectly chipped out with a dull edged chisel. There were some marks in it that might have been dimples if the material had been softer and the instrument finer, but which, as it was, were only dints. The chisel had made three or four of these attempts at embellishment over his nose, but had given them up without an effort to smooth them off. I judged him to be a bachelor from the frayed condition of his linen, and he appeared to have sustained a good many bereavements, for he wore at least four mourning rings, besides a brooch representing a lady, and a weeping willow at a tomb with an urn on it. I noticed, too, that several rings and seals hung at his watch-chain, as if he were quite laden with remembrances of departed friends. He had glittering eyes, small, keen.
keen and black, and thin, wide, mottled lips. He had had them, to the best of my belief, for forty to fifty years. Wow, what a great description of Wemmick there. Um, notice the um, caricature that's being created of him as almost like a, a wooden creature, almost not human, it's sort of unfully developed. Um, We've also got this reminder of Gothic symbolism again, with the mourning rings that he's wearing and, and the sort of symbols that are on them. Um, we find out elsewhere in the book that Wemmick sort of really values portable property, things that you can carry about your person that can't necessarily be stolen or taken from you. Um, and so all of these um, sort of in a disturbing way come from Jaggers' clients that, that have possibly been hanged or are no longer with us and, and Wemmick has, has um, taken them for himself for himself um, and so this description from Pip is, is sort of is from the retrospective older Pip looking back um, but it's beautifully crafted and beautifully created um, but we have this idea as well of um, judgment and and uh, characters being questioned and examined have a look at this he wore his hat on the back of his head and looked straight before him walking in a self-contained way as if there were nothing in the streets to claim his attention his mouth was such a post office of a mouth that he had a mechanical appearance of smiling we had got to the top of Hoburn Hill before I knew that it was merely a mechanical appearance and that he was not smiling at all. Do you know where Mr. Matthew Pocket lives? I asked Mr. Wemmick. Yes, said he, nodding in the direction. At Hammersmith, west of London. Is that far? Well, say five miles. Do you know him? Why, you're a regular cross-examiner, said Mr. Wemmick, looking at me with an approving air. Yes, I know him. I know him. So the fact that Wemmick calls Pip a cross-examiner is, is really important. Lots of characters are, are examined and questioned and judged within the book. Um, Pumbletook sort of examines and questions Pip all the time in part one as, as he, when he's a child. Um, Jaggers, in every conversation he ever seems to have with anybody, seems to question and examine them. And so this brings back this whole idea of crime and guilt and, and, and Victorian attitudes towards the law. Um, and so it's a really important idea that, that Pip is also seen to be part of that society. Now we have another fantastic um, description, just like the one of Smithfields when Pip first arrives at Barnard's Inn. So let's take a look at this one together. He said, here we were at Barnard's Inn. My depression was not alleviated by the announcement, for I had supposed that establishment to be an hotel kept by Mr. Barnard, to which the Blue Boar in our town was a mere public house. Whereas I now found Barnard to be a disembodied spirit, or a fiction, and his inn the dingiest collection of shabby buildings ever squeezed together in a rank corner as a club for tomcats. We entered this haven through a wicket gate and were disgorged by an introductory passage into a melancholy little square that looked to me like a flat burying ground. I thought it had the most dismal trees in it and the most dismal sparrows and the most dismal cats and the most dismal houses in number half a dozen or so that I had ever seen. I thought the windows of the sets of chambers into which those houses were divided were in every stage of dilapidated blind and curtain, crippled flower pot, cracked glass, dusty decay and miserable makeshift, while to let, to let, to let glared at me from empty rooms as if no new wretches ever came there, and the vengeance of the soul of Barnard were being slowly appeased by the gradual suicide of the present occupants and their unholy internment under the gavel, under the gravel. A frowsy morning of soot and smoke tired this forlorn creation of Barnard as it had strewn ashes on its head and was undergoing penance and humiliation as a mere dust hole. Thus, for my sense of sight, while dry rot and wet rot and all the 
silent ruts that rut in neglected roof and cellar, rut of rat and mouse and bug and coaching stable near at hand besides, addressed themselves faintly to my sense of smell and moaned, try Barnard's mixture. What another great description of a, of a horrible setting from retrospective older Pip narrating to us here. He uses some fantastic um, imagery and, it, and it's Dickens using this, remember, not Pip. Um, Dickens as a writer, uh, really showing off um, some of his greatest, um, greatest tropes. Um, the first one we can have a look at is um, I want to think actually about a link here with the great Gatsby and, and the description of the Valley of Ashes that Fitzgerald gives. So many links here with dirt, ash, death, dust, uh, greyness. So it's really worth reading the Valley of Ashes and this together and, and making those connections with, with what Fitzgerald and Dickens are showing about the most impoverished um, settings in society. But let's have a look at the personification element, this idea of the, the signs in the windows reading to let, to let, to let, glaring at Pip from empty rooms as though all the other, um, no one else ever comes here and all the other inhabitants are committing suicide. It's the signs that are communicating with him, not um, the inhabitants themselves. Um, we get this idea of guilt and shame and dirt once again, um, as though Pip feels he's being sort of... Um, watched and accused by those to let signs. But notice how his expectation was that Barnard's would be like a grand hotel, um, which would make the Blue Boar back where he grew up look like just a, a normal pub. But actually this place, their former courtrooms, which have been abandoned and re sort of purposed as lodging houses, they're not pretty, they're not comfortable or particularly exotic. Um, and so Pip is shocked and appalled. And, um, and once again, it's the dirt and the dust that seems to stick to Pip that he can't escape. And, and that's symbolic of his meeting with the convict right in the first chapter. He can't escape this. It's stuck to him. It, he can't um, ever rid it from his life. Um, and so this passage will really reward a really sort of close examination of, of the language, um, particularly this idea. Barnard's strewing ashes on its own head and undergoing penance and humiliation as a mere dust hole, as though it's sort of doing it to itself, as opposed to, to being done by, by anyone in human society. So a fantastic bit of description that you really should read again and really think about carefully. The third thing then we're going to have a look at is the sort of coincidence of plots that Herbert Pocket is the pale young gentleman. And, and this is just one of the links to Pip's past. And I'm going to make the, the connection that these links to Pip's past of, of Herbert, the pale young gentleman who he's met before, link to this idea of dirt and, and, and shame that stick to Pip throughout the novel. There's all sorts of things which keep cropping up throughout the novel that Pip just can't escape. This is the end of the chapter. This is Herbert speaking. The chambers are retired and we shall be alone together. But we shan't fight, I dare say. But dear me, I beg your pardon, you're holding the fruit all this time. Pray, let me take these bags from you. I am quite ashamed. As I stood opposite to Mr. Pocket, Jr., delivering him the bags, one, two, I saw the starting appearance come into his own eyes that I knew to be in mine. And he said, falling back, Lord bless me, you're the prowling boy, and you, said I, are the pale young gentleman. And that's the end of the chapter. So first thing we'll notice is that Pip leaves it, not Pip, Dickens leaves us on a, on a cliffhanger, one of the key features of serialisation. We want readers to come back the next week to find out what's going to happen now that Pip and the pale young gentleman have been reunited. Will there be another fight between them? Will they argue over Estella or Miss Havisham? What's the connection going to be? And so this connection is really important. Um, Again, to show that Pip struggles to escape his past. This gives him a link still with Miss Havisham, um, with Estella that he can't get away from. And it's also a reminder of violence. His first interaction with the poor young gentleman was one of violence. His upbringing from Mrs. Joe Gargery was one of violence. His meeting with the convict was a violent one. Orlick attacked Mrs. Joe, violence. It's followed him to London, the, the um, criminal lawyer Jaggers dealing with um, public hangings, violence. 
it's following Pip everywhere throughout the novel. Okay, so it's really important now that we've got that coincidental connection because it's in the next chapter that Herbert is able to fill in more information about Miss Havisham. So it's a really important plot device uh, as well as, as, as a coincidence. So as we move on to chapter 22, this is a really important chapter because it's one that's mostly narrated by Herbert, uh, who tells the story of Miss Havisham. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is um, Pip's lesson on becoming a gentleman. And, and meals are a really important thing within Great Expectations that we'll have a look at in full at a later date. Um, but just in brief, think about um, the meal Pip has um, at the forge uh, when he's just encountered the convict for the first time. And he's trying to steal a bit of food for the convict and, and the bread is and the butter is delivered by Mrs. Joe in, in a very unkindly, unfriendly, unwelcoming way. Um, uh, but the meal that Pip shares here with, with Herbert is, is kind, is generous, there's humour, um, and Herbert tries to educate Pip and, and welcoming in, welcome him into London society. So let's have a look um, at what we have here, and, and there's a bit of humour in here as well. Let me introduce the topic, Handel. Remember, that's the name that Herbert's given Pip. By mentioning that in London, it is not the custom to put the knife in the mouth for fear of accidents, and that while the fork is reserved for that use, it is not put further in than necessary. It is scarcely worth mentioning, only it's as well to do as other people do. Also, the spoon is not generally used overhand, but under. This has two advantages. You get of your mouth better, which after all is the object, and you save a good deal of attitude of operate opening oysters on the part of the right elbow. He offered these friendly suggestions in such a lively way that we both laughed and I scarcely blushed. So Pip has a little bit of shame here at his coarse, common, labouring boy manners. Um, but unlike Estella, who criticises and chastises Pip, Herbert is, is kind and, and supports Pip and, and sort of teaches him how, how to do this in a better way. Um, also within that chapter, we have um, other moments where where Herbert does this for um, for Pip. Um, let me just find it within the book. Uh, chapter 22. He also says to, to Pip, take another glass of wine and excuse my mentioning that society as a body does not expect one to be so strictly conscientious in emptying one's glass as to turn it bottom upwards with the rim on one's nose. So, the the comedy here comes in the fact that Herbert is telling Pip the story of, of Miss Havisham's past, quite a serious story, one that we're quite interested in. And he keeps interrupting the story with um, comments on, on what Pip's doing. And another thing that Pip does is he tries to stuff his whole napkin into a tiny little tumbler on the table. And Herbert keeps noticing these um, these faux pas, these sort of societal errors. And, gently correcting Pip along the way. So we have these humorous little interludes within the story. This chapter is so important because Herbert, as a guest narrator, is very much like Jordan Baker and Gatsby uh, when they narrate parts of Nick's um, novel, The Great Gatsby. Herbert is telling us things that Pip could not possibly have known and therefore sort of filling in the gaps for us so that we get that background of Miss Havisham. And, and this is a narrative choice that Dickens is giving us. Now, some questions arise here for us as readers, some really intriguing questions. What has happened to Miss Havisham's brother and her lover? Where have they ended up? Herbert does not know. And also, who are Estella's parents? So we have these unanswered questions now, which are, which are going to sort of follow Pip through the novel. Um, and then we get the moral lesson from, from Matthew Pocket. Um, and we're going to have a look at that um, in a moment. So Herbert goes on to narrate and tell the story of Miss Havisham and the purpose of Estella was to be Miss Havisham's way of vicariously, so living through Estella, getting her revenge on all mankind. So Herbert tells us the story of her um, being due to inherit the family business, being due to inherit property, uh, meeting a fiancé, getting, getting engaged, having a warning from Matthew Pocket but ignoring it and then sort of disowning him, and she's jilted on her wedding day. But the bit I want to focus on is, is the sort of warning message that um, Matthew Pocket gives. Let's read it together. 
It is a principle of his that no man who was not a true gentleman at heart ever was, since the world began, a true gentleman in manner. He says, no varnish can hide the grain of the wood, and that the more varnish you put on, the more grain will express itself. Now that will need to be read a couple of times. It's a difficult one to get your head around and, and can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. But essentially what I think Matthew Pocket's warning is, is saying here is, is similar to, again, something from Macbeth. Um, false face does hide what the false heart does know. In that um, those who are have bad intentions can sort of hide it on their face. We can't read it. So um, Miss Havisham's fiance and, and half brother, brother-in-law, um, uh, sort of look like they have a good good intentions. They look honest and genuine and like gentlemen, but they're not really at heart. And so what Matthew Pocket is saying is that anyone who is a true gentleman at heart um, is always a true gentleman in manner. So if, if they are not, then they're not really a gentleman. Um, and that varnishing, so varnish is something you put on wood to sort of make it look smooth and shiny, can't hide the fact that you're not a gentleman. It will only expose it further, make the grain express itself more. And so this is one of the things that this whole book is about, is, is being a gentleman. Doesn't necessarily mean having money and fortune and property and wealth and position in society, which is what Pip imagines it does and why he becomes such a snob. But being a gentleman is actually about being a gentle man. It's about your morals, your behaviour, your attitudes, the way you treat other people and, and your position um, within society. And I think that's something that Dickens is really trying to get across through this novel. Now, the final part that we're going to have a look at really briefly is chapter 23 is, is a comic interlude in the pocket household. And there's two things that I'll touch upon briefly. It shows us more domestic turmoil and reminds us of the role of family. So we can think here about um, Mrs. Joe and Pip's family and his childhood and compare that. And we can also compare his time at Miss Havisham, who's almost like a, a mother figure to Stella and to him and the way he is treated there. And so what we see is is sort of um, another disorderly family unit not working properly. Um, but because of Dickens's constraints of serialisation, scenes such as this one um, and the ones um, with Estella at Richmond and um, and Drummond and the boys at, at Finchley Grove, they're, they're underdeveloped. And, and if Dickens was releasing monthly rather than weekly, maybe he would have developed them more. But it, it's a comic interlude more than anything. OK. So. There's some wider reading and watching that I'd like you to do this week. And um, there's quite a lot, but if you sort of divide it up, it, it shouldn't be too overwhelming. The first thing I want you to do is um, read this Victorian web article about Smithfield Market, just to give you more background information and understanding of Victorian markets, how society viewed this market, what sort of attitudes and opinions towards it were. And that will give you some real background about sort of what London is really like in Victorian society. Number two, I want you to read and make Cornell notes on the Word document I've sent you called Crime in Great Expectations. Again, some more background information, some different interpretations, uh, which will sort of expand your knowledge. So please read and, and make some Cornell notes on, on that. Similarly, do the same thing for Victorian prisons and punishment. I want you to get a deeper understanding of those as well. Very different from our prison and punishment system now. That touches upon things like the hulks as well as Newgate Prison. Uh, fourth, I'd like you to read and add um, to your context notes about uh, Dickens's writing on public executions. And that, that image has been shared in a Word document for you as well. And then finally, I want you to watch the Masalit video lecture by John Bowen on playing with the law. There's also four other video lectures there that are quite short. This one's about nine minutes maximum. Um, and again, take notes and really think about how that connects in with, with everything in these chapters. OK, so we've got a very different type of novel here at the start of volume two from what we had in volume one. And finally, some writing practice, um, not necessarily a full essay, but some really focused um, uh, analysis is what I'm looking for here. So a couple of detailed paragraphs. I'd like you to critically evaluate the effectiveness of the methods Dickens uses to present either Smithfield Market or Barnard's Inn. So go back to those paragraphs I shared earlier in this video um, 
describing Pip's arrival at Smithfield, describing his arrival at Barnard's. And I want you to start your piece of writing with a question. So I want you to think of a question that this text raises. What um, is Dickens showing us about Victorian society? What do we learn about attitudes to social um, cleanliness, hygiene? Um, what do we learn about um, uh, impoverished settings? What do we learn about um, the city of London? And, and that from there you can come up with your, your thesis, as, as in what do you think Dickens is, is revealing? What do you think this novel is teaching us? What do you think this um, novel is presenting about um, the incongruity between expectations of, of class and wealth and being a gentleman and the reality for, for someone such as Pip? So really focus on, on sort of word level vocabulary, focus on picking apart the language, the choices and um, really use your context sheet to think about why Dickens is doing it in this way and really unpick for me um, how uh, Dickens is presenting these two settings. If it helps, you could do something similar for the Valley of Ashes and even have a go at comparing um, the Valley of Ashes with one of these two settings if you'd like to have a go at doing that. Although I haven't explicitly taught you how to compare yet, it's something that you can practice if, if you wish. But the very minimum, please, is just a paragraph or two um, on Smithfield Market and Barnard's Inn. Uh, and if you could return those to me by Monday the 11th of May by email, that would be fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed today's video lesson. Lots and lots of information. Um, so please come back to it, rewatch it, um, email me any questions that you have, um, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching.